Good morning, everybody. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Mukul, are we good to start? Hi, good morning. Yes, Monica, you may start, yes. Once again, a very good morning, everybody. I'm Monica Bish, and I shall be your host for this session. I hope all of you are doing well and keeping safe. Well, yes, we are living through turbulent times. The current pandemic has transformed almost every aspect of our personal, community, and national lives. It has compelled the economies world over to grapple with an unprecedented and adverse crisis. Fortunately, the government across Caribbean have been proactive to respond to the situation. Although with different speed, by now most countries in the region have taken significant measures at policy level to manage the situation. There are new schemes and grants being rolled out to boost the economy and ensure public welfare. But while we are in uncharted territory and policy responses are still evolving, policymakers are facing significant implementation challenges in terms of rolling out various grant management programs. For example, governments are unable to reach vulnerable households through traditional transfers where there are no extensive social assistance systems already in place and where informal informality is prevalent. And that brings me to the theme of today's webinar. Are your government departments and agencies prepared to provide fiscal relief to citizens during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, on the panel with us, we have some heavyweight experts. Well, not literally heavy, but in terms of the depth and experience they bring to the subject. We have with us Mr. Colin Pink Show. He is the advisory service line leader for EY Caribbean and has over 30 years of accounting, auditing, and financial services experience and has served large corporate clients in the Caribbean from a senior advisory capacity. Joining Colin is Mr. John Outrage. John has over 10 years of consulting experience in technology and digital transformation. He has consulted on several large scale ICT transformation programs for various clients across Caribbean. Add to it, we have Mr. Arpan Bansal, Global Head for Government Practice at Nugen. Arpan has over 18 years of experience in managing and delivering large scale digital transformation projects for government departments world over, right from US all the way to Australia. So Colin and John will take us through a broad overview of what grants program is all about and the role of government in executing it. And then Arpan will take us deep into how Nugent can help Caribbean governments execute grants management program more effectively across the range of country. So without taking more time, I pass on the controls to Colin and John. Over to you, Colin. Monica, thanks a lot. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for um, joining the webinar this morning. We at Ernst & Young and at NewGen, we are very happy to be able to share some perspectives with you this morning. I think Monica gave a great overview of some of the challenges and some of the responses taken by the Caribbean governments uh, across this region. Uh, if I can just talk for a few minutes about EY, as Monica indicated, I am the advisory managing partner for EY Caribbean. We have offices in eight countries, from Jamaica further up in the north, uh, all the way down to Ghana and Suriname, which sits on the mainland of South America. Uh, we we uh, view the government and public sector as the most strategic sector for our advisory practice. And in the world today, we deem it very important to not only work from home with COVID-19 around us, but to also collaborate with organizations that, that offer high quality solutions like Nugen. And the world today is all about collaboration, it's all about alliances, it's all about strategic partnerships. So at EY Caribbean, we're very happy to have this uh, collaboration going with, with Nugen. 
and uh, hopefully we will be able to um, present you with some good ideas today and to also talk to you about some solutions. So why are we here today? What we have recognized uh, working across the region is that with the shutdown that has taken place in the economic environment um, with COVID, there's been a dramatic increase in the welfare system and governments across the region are uh, challenged to be able to provide the sub financial support to their population. So what we are trying to do today is to provide uh, all of our participants here today with some ideas as to how technology can help you with transformation and to indicate to you some of the solutions that can be offered to you today. Before we get into the specifics of the solutions, I think one of the things that we wanted to do is to talk about the reality of the challenges facing Caribbean governments. So in this first slide, we are highlighting primary forces, forces that I'm sure that everybody on this webinar this morning would recognize. But I'd speak to a few of them. So for example, we are experiencing issues relating to climate change. We have been ex experiencing an increasing incidence of hurricanes. Those matters present significant financial and social challenges to our governments and to our citizens. I think many countries in the Caribbean are experiencing long-term fiscal challenges. With COVID-19 present and real, with a crisis in the tourism sector, and with a crisis in the oil and gas sector where I live in Trinidad, the fiscal challenges are likely to intensify in the, in the, in, in the near future. So what we are experiencing uh, a range of primary forces, a range of global forces that are impacting small economies. And we recognize that that is going to make, uh, present governments with very unique challenges. So what we are trying to be able to do is to talk to our clients, talk to the government and public sector about how to deal with a rapidly changing environment, particularly with COVID-19 and with economic pain and with challenges in the healthcare system. So some of the barriers that, that, that we've identified as we work across the region, barriers that impact digital adoption, barriers that impact government services to citizens and to business, uh, budgetary constraints. So we know that a lot of our governments are facing fiscal deficits, and therefore a lot of focus is spent on providing certain basic services to our citizens and to businesses in the region. But we feel that with the disruptive nature of technology, there are significant opportunities available to all governments in the, at this point in time to be able to provide um, op, to be able to provide technology solutions to citizens and to businesses. Okay. Um, we recognize that we understand the challenges in government. Um, we recognize, for example, that many of our smaller markets have been impacted by the OECD and European Union blacklisting, which has affected our ability to run our offshore centers. Other markets have been affected by the responses to the citizen investment program, the end to preferable trade regimes. So quite apart from having to deal with our internal challenges, as I mentioned on the first slide, there's a range of forces that are forcing us to consider carefully what we have to do. What COVID-19 has done is it has created a major fallout in three sectors. The economy, or in three areas, I should say more correctly, the business community and on our people. So what we've seen in the markets as we go across the market is that the private sector has also significant, has experienced significant contraction. And that is having a huge impact on, on employment levels, right? And therefore, that is leading to a dramatic increase in the welfare state. For example, in most of our markets, tourism, hospitality, the airline business, the cruise ship business are taking the brunt of it. But the other sectors are also being impacted at this point in time. Services, manufacturing, and in Trinidad and Tobago, oil and gas. When you look at the entire picture, what you see is an increase in unemployment, both private and public, and heightened social risk. So these are very significant areas that have to be considered very carefully. And the barriers uh, to digital adoption, these, these present real barriers to digital adoption as, as governments are now very focused on, on, on doing the, the basic, providing the basic services to their citizens. 
In the region, one of the factors that we have to take into account is where are we in terms of our, our, our level of connectedness, our digital maturity. And our sense of it is that the region, by and large, is somewhere between the foundational presence and the emerging presence, okay? Um, but governments in the region are going to have to work really hard and really smart in order to be able to ensure that they could become more technologically savvy, they could introduce digital solutions into their service environment, and they can ensure that over time, they're able to move from emerging to enhanced, and hopefully at some point in time, to a connected presence, All right? The vulnerabilities of small scale and limited economies of scale exist in the Caribbean. COVID-19, in a sense, has not really changed the need for leadership among our countries. But what it has changed is that the risk of failure has increased dramatically. So we need strong leadership sponsorship for digital transformation. We need to recognize that this requires policy support, financial support, infrastructure support, and skill resources. We know for a fact that among our Caribbean partners, we've seen governments challenged with insufficient budgets, IT projects that overpromise and underdeliver and IT projects that have significant budget overruns. We also know that across our markets, there's been a lack of integration, a lack of interoperability. But despite all of these legacy IT problems, we are still faced with this challenge. And as I mentioned earlier on, what COVID-19 has done is not changed the need for leadership, but it has significantly increased the risk of failure. So with that in mind, we are hoping that this session would be able to provide you with some insights as to some of the solutions that could be brought to the table. Uh, the grant programs across the region are by and large similar. We are not seeing any significant differences. What we've tried to do here is to provide you with a picture of some of the um, um, solutions that have been presented by the Caribbean governments and to try and quantify it. Please bear in mind that these numbers are moving targets and therefore um, these numbers could be outdated by tomorrow. But a lot of the focus is on unemployment relief, low income and vulnerable groups, to some extent self-employment relief and to some extent small businesses. Uh, welfare and social programs have also been augmented significantly. But by and large, our Caribbean governments are really challenged to provide a significant stimulus into the business sector. So we anticipate that if COVID-19 is not significantly resolved by way of a vaccine in the near future, over the next six to nine months, the pressure on welfare and social programs are going to increase dramatically. I know it's something difficult for everybody to understand, but this is something that we need to, 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 to take into account. This is not a static position, it's a moving target, okay? So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to John Outridge, who is with us and who Monica introduced. John, can you see the new slide? Can you take over from here? Yes, sure, thanks, Colin. So morning again, everyone. And again, just taking off from where Colin kind of um, was speaking to on the last slide. So right now, the Caribbean is basically, you know, almost all countries or jurisdictions are, are trying to deal with the same problem. Um, and what we are seeking to do here this morning is to kind of basically put that process almost in a framework to, to give those who are not part of the social sector uh, an insight in terms of what these agencies, what these governments, are really looking at in terms of the holistic process. And it's, re it's really broken down into two key areas. So again, in terms of how do you receive those grants? You know, how, how do you facilitate the application? How do you then review? How, how do you go through that approval cycle? And then obviously disbursements and, and management of that. And it's a very unique process for governments because it's not, it's, it's, it's not a process where, you know, it, it's very, it's time sensitive and it's really treating with the human condition. So the idea of it is that you want to basically get people through this process as quickly as possible because the end result is, is something that's, that's desperate on, on the citizens and it's, it's, it's relief at the end of the day. 
So what we just what, what are we doing here really is to really kind of show what, what are the key stakeholders within that process. Obviously, you would have persons within the national insurance sector. Um, you would also have commercial banks being a part of that. You will obviously have the ministries, departments, and agencies. Obviously, Caribbean governments are structured differently, but at the end of the day, you have these key stakeholders, um, the labor ministry, et cetera. Um, the current challenges from what I have seen in my experience, and again, these challenges are, are what are currently being experienced right now um, by government agencies, because again, um, this is the, the process that, that countries have been dealing with in terms of their own um, social programs and, and in terms of providing relief to its citizens. And you know, a, a lot hasn't changed really, and so it, it's still um, very manual. Uh, the, the application process is still based in paper. There's, there's documentation um, to review. There's a lot of manual validation. Obviously, all those things, you know, kind of as a domino effect, and then it, 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 it basically delays approvals. It, it delays the disbursement process, and uh, again, it provides an, a, a huge amount of administrative burden. Not to any, not just a single agency, but across government. Because again, there's, it's, you know, when you look at the numbers Colin presented on that slide, um, if you give me 36 million US dollars today, I would personally, I would take a, a lot of time to distribute that myself. So you can imagine governments now having to treat that to, to get it out to citizens, right? And then on the disbursement side, let's say the, the recipients of these grants, so obviously. Um, citizens are, are really the key areas, right? Or, or SMEs at, at the end of the day. So what, what, what we're going to do in terms of the middle head as highlighted in yellow is really in terms of, and, and this is kind of going to feed into the new gen area, what, what can you do to improve the process, right? So obviously um, a digital KYC process, knowing your customer to kind of expedite application and, and approval process, right? Looking at um, validating data without having to, to physically um, review documents, um, match it back, contact, corresponding agencies, et cetera, taking the opportunity to, to connect with, with other government databases, right? Uh, given the, the advent of COVID-19, so all of this now has to have the added layer of complexity where you have to do a lot of this remotely to try to protect citizens, you know, to, to keep enforcing into the physical distance measures, et cetera. And then obviously from a disbursement and monitoring perspective, um, what do you do now in terms of being able to distribute all of these funds accordingly, being able to monitor the process and, and and basically to, to streamline and, and get data and get analytics. Because at the end of the day, the same persons, the whole point of the social system is that the same persons you're dealing with now, you want to have a level of case management in there because they, they may be part of your program now, but it may be indicative of you know, other conditions that they may be experiencing that the, the, the social agencies may want, may want to monitor and track persons within this program. So Colin, could you um, skip to the other slide, please? Just hold a second. Sure. Not sure why it's not moving. Not getting it to move. Uh, is law, Moosey's law. Yeah, just hold a second. Sure. So while Colin is trying to, that's to, to move that slide to, because what I'm going to show basically is uh, almost, and it's again, come. thanks Colin. Yeah. It, what does that indicative grant process looks like? And, and again, what we did to kind of represent here is we would have looked at the various processes across the Caribbean. And again, this is not reflective of any one process, but it's almost like an amalgamation, but it should give the persons on this webinar a sense in terms of what these agencies have to experience, right? So. At the top layer, we, we kind of almost look at what is typically the current state process. So at the beginning of that process, you have applicants. Now, a lot of persons may not be in the, what you would call the commercial banking system. They, they may what be classified as the unbanked. So you have a lot of persons who may fall into this bucket who need relief, who either one do not have bank accounts or, or basically from recipients within this process may not want their, their payments going through the bank and prefer to collect um, a physical check. Now, that in a sense is obviously creates both uh, opportunities and, and, and issues, right? 
So from a process perspective, you know, obviously from a government area, you obviously have to register these persons. They have to now provide all of these documentation and they now have to get that physically to uh, an agency to review, et cetera, right? Now, looking at that process, then you also know it goes over to the ministry and the agency who now has to deal with all of this validation and, and obviously incomplete applications, um, contacting back the person, trying to get the information correct. And, and as you can imagine, that creates a ton of issues, both from a, a, a customer service aspect as well as administrative burden internally at the agency. Uh, following any, obviously, when you, that data is validated and the application is good to go, then that now has to basically be processed. And when you're looking at it, uh, if it's, for example, and I think we have seen this a, a lot in terms of different countries, you have a lot of persons having to, to collect physical checks, which, again, that goes on top of existing government processes because it's, it's similar to the health system. There, there isn't a, a parallel accounting system then or a parallel social system that is dealing with these grants, uh, similar to what, what different to what the health is experiencing. So it's coming across the same infrastructure and the same group of persons that, that, that have to do the business as usual. So this, again, is creating loads and, and pressure on the system. So obviously, there's going to be now uh, an even greater audience to, to facilitate payments too. So from a physical aspect, when you have to print checks, for example, that is obviously going to take a lot of time. And, and that is going to result, obviously, in terms of the, the pace in which you want to get these grants out, it may also result in, in areas. So some of the key deficiencies in that process is obviously it's very manual, so it's prone to errors, right? Um, obviously, persons and, and you know, this, these are things that this is just the reality of where we are, that this system could be prone to obviously error and, and, and fraud, persons trying to defraud the system to, to get these grants. And then obviously it's extremely resource intensive. So at the end of the day, it's, it's not really the ideal process. So looking forward and looking into the future. And again, this is one process that I can say that technology would bring a lot of opportunity and, and benefits to, you know, obviously we see in the industry, you know, technology is not always the answer, but in this particular instance, I mean, technology does check a lot of the boxes. So looking at the future state and then ideally what, what would be a much better process is obviously if that enrollment was obviously web enabled, um, having an, a, a KYC authentication built in so that you could validate information from the person, right? They could upload their forms um, digitally in, into the system. That obviously would, would, would be facilitated through a, a case management process. Because again, the, the greatest opportunity that, that from a social agency here is that using this COVID situation to really understand the needs of, of citizens and, and understand what they are going through. Because again, it may be this grant today, but then those same persons need to come back into the ministry tomorrow for some other needs. So being able to capture that up front and, and properly manage that case, you know, as, as, as I like to say, having basically a single door approach into the social services system. So no, no one door is the wrong door. Right, and then also being able to, to monitor electronically, and, and this goes back to even on the citizen end because what you have happening, if you look at the, the manual processes, you have persons who would have submitted a grant, and, and again, you would probably look at social media and you would see, and they're just waiting. There's no communication, there's no facilitation, then they're not understanding the, the nuances of the process that's going on. But again, electronically, if I submit my application, I should be able to track it then. At least that would ease the anxiety and give me some sense of the process. Where am I in that process chain, right? So again, from a even from a customer support point of view, that should theoretically ease administration. And then over in terms of disbursement. So obviously, again, you know, you would have the the challenges of being able to distribute to, to uh, citizens in terms of those who have commercial bank accounts and those who may not. But removing checks from that process is obviously is, is a big step. And what we have seen in other markets and in certain jurisdictions is the introduction of a payment card where those funds can be basically directly debited onto that card. So then on the citizens end, there isn't that additional burden or additional issue to collect a check, go into the bank, cash that check, or what you find happening in a lot of jurisdictions is that checks also creates a predatory environment for, for those persons. So again, they may go into the local villages, et cetera. They may try to change the check and those checks are changed at a premium, et cetera. So again, it basically, the whole idea is to streamline the process for these citizens and to get them the relief that, that they need. So the benefits of this process obviously is, 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 is automated. 
Um, we're looking at direct integration and, and real-time validations, taking the opportunity to look at different other databases and streamline that process. And then obviously, basically reducing the overall administrative effort and, and leveraging automation and workflows to reduce the administrative effort going forward. So Colin, can I skip to the final slide? So this is my final step I hand over to, to the new gen team. So I just wanted to just highlight some of these key pain points that obviously technology can address with this process. And, and one, obviously, inefficient caseload management. Because at the end of the day, what is happening right now is you're just dealing with applications and trying to get them out, but the opportunity is being lost in terms of inputting this into an actual case management type platform where you can obviously monitor the success and, 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 and the process. Slow intake and application processing, right? So again, Right now, I'm sure a lot of different agencies are dealing with the process of trying to print thousands and thousands of application forms and then to distribute that to different agencies to get them out, right? The, the basically inability to collaborate across, because again, it's the social ministry today, but then you will also have other agencies that need to also um, lay, weigh into some of these processes. Somebody may, may also need, for example, a, a REM grant and obviously a housing ministry or housing agency would, would also require that information. So having the person not being able to, to do this process three, four times, um, streamline obviously the fragmented service delivery. So again, from the citizens then, um, they're just focused on basically the application. Their job shouldn't be to follow up on the application. That should be done systematically, right? Being able to provide some sort of means test, some sort of ability to, to validate applications. So again, not having that onus administratively on the agencies, right? Um, obviously, reducing the amount of staff frustration because, as I mentioned before, um, this is a very novel situation. And unlike the health sector, this is impacting the current process. There is not a parallel social system dealing with this. Obviously, on the citizen end, having a, a, a peace of mind, obviously, understanding, having some transparency into the process that can help alleviate issues. And then overall, by basically kind of putting a process in place, reducing uh, abuse and fraud um, within the system. So, Monica, I think that's the end of, of my slides by hand over to, to Newton. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, John. That was a great session. And all the more thanks for highlighting EY Nugen partnership in the region. In fact, the Alliance aims to offer a high value end-to-end -end digital transformation portfolio with business advisory services integrated on a technology platform. Well, Colin, you rightly mentioned that government will have to adopt digital solutions for service delivery and to control the risk of failure. In fact, I was going through a forester research and it said the time to take a long view of automation is now. Automation has been a driver of change in organizations long before the pandemic, but now it has become a boardroom imperative with a new urgency, business risk and resiliency. The emerging technologies play a crucial role as an enabler and facilitator for providing solutions for business continuity. And that has been well covered uh, in the session by Colin and John. And Arpan, what, what we look to understand from you is how technology as an underlying layer to a successful grants management program. Before I hand it over to you, Arpan, let me add here for our audience that at the end of the presentation, we'll be having a question and answer session. We request you to type your questions in the question window of the GoToMeeting anytime during the webinar, and we'll address them towards the end of the session. So over to you, Arpan. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, Colin and John, for setting uh, up such a great context for me to start. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with a quick overview of uh, a new zen. Uh, we have about 540 uh, active customers across 66 countries, uh, spanning across 20 vertical. Uh, we have several large and mission critical uh, implementations for BFSI and public sector customers. 
we offer software products in the area of enterprise content management business process management case management and customer communication management uh, all our products are rated very well in gartner magic quadrant and forester wave reports uh, we are we are possibly the only company who with all these four core product featuring into magic quadrant as colin uh, mentioned that news and an ey has a very uh, strong partnership and we are committed to serve our customers in caribbean region i would like to pick up from where uh, john uh, uh, left uh, and i think grant making is complex and it is even more complex in the cases of uh, crisis situations like covid or hurricane and this is obvious because on the one hand we have uh, pressing urgencies and on the other hand large funding is involved so we need compliances we need uh, transparency in the system and system has to be auditable typically we have seen with our experience that grant making becomes complex due to a lot of manual work which is involved like managing paper working with different multiple systems uh, communication with the grantee is also very cumbersome when it happens through multiple channels like email physical communication or phone it also involves uh, very involved approval cycles and at the end of it disbursement is also a very uh, complex process because it needs a lot of due diligence and what we have seen is that in most such cases there is there is always a need of reporting uh, periodic progress to a central agency in terms of either sending them over a report or filing a report over the central portal needless to say that manual system adds no value in terms of uh, the continuous learning of the organization or or it doesn't prepare organizations to take better decisions as as they starts uh, providing more and more schemes in terms of funding now focus of rest of my presentation is to is to share with you that how can we help uh, simplify grant making and i will highlight some of the salient features of newsens grant management system to support that my intention is to give you a good idea on how a grant in any unusual circum circumstances like this can be rolled out very fast obviously using our uh, robust and flexible bpm platform while still keeping system auditable to provide much needed transparency i will try to highlight some advanced features that ca that can help reduce manual work increase efficiency and give a better insight into data uh, we will see a quick sneak peek into how the whole system works and i don't want to leave uh, special features that we have built into our system to support remote working because that is that has become an integral part of every application now these days and finally i will share some case studies to to you know leave more data points with you to begin with uh, let me just quickly give a typical life cycle of a grant it starts with the applicant uh, submitting his application through very different various different channels like ranging from physical paper to the portal or mobile app it has to go through eligibility check once the eligibility check is qualified then it goes through a review and approval cycle during this review approval cycle if there are other systems uh, available electronically from where the integration can be done to automate some checkpoints that can be done from there onwards uh, there can be some situations where additional documentation or information is required or or some exception uh, can come this is all part of this grant approval workflow and once the grant is approved it goes to the disbursement cycle where the fund management monitoring is needed 
and eventually uh, when it comes to closure all this document including the information communication uh, the notes comments goes in a case file which then can be archived for long term for audit and compliance purpose now this is one of the most important slides from uh, my uh, perspective uh, as it highlights the core construct of our grants management system which is built on a, a comprehensive bpm platform and all components are uh, has built in configurability so you see uh, we have a master data management which is basically which can encapsulate uh, data of any grant or a scheme using that data model we have a, a form builder uh, using drag and drop uh, responsive highly responsive when it intuitive interfaces can be created right for both uh, uh, applicant as well as for the grant officers to approve any any application and uh, thereafter we have a rule engine and the rule engine can uh, is basically used to uh, you write the rules in if and else and in a very simple way the rules are isolated from process so that the process changes can be minimized in case of any rule is changed and rules are basically around checking eligibility or guiding workflow to the uh, to a, to any approval in in any approval process and then you see we have a graphically graphical modeling tool uh, it is again based on drag and drop where a comprehensive workflow can be designed in a in a low code uh, approach even the integrations can be modeled in a low code approach the whole platform is bundled with a portal framework uh, from where an applicant can come uh, can apply for an for for a grant can check his eligibility uh, the multiple channels are supported it is available as a mobile app or responsive forms on mobile browser uh, in situations where uh, maybe due to the digital readiness if uh, mobile app or portal can't be used then we have we support all the traditional means of application through paper form or uh, people calling up uh, a phone number and init initiating their service request it is also uh, augmented by some of the modern technologies that i'll talk in uh, more in next slide there are dashboards available uh, this dashboards a new dashboard can be configured very quickly without without uh, writing any piece of code and these dashboards can give real time visibility into performance of grant processes now the platform that i was speaking about is powered with some of the modern technologies such as rpa to seek repeated and mundane activities and automate them using bots it is also augmented with artificial intelligence and machine learning Uh, to get better insight into data and understand the impact of uh, social protection schemes in our experience typically what we have seen is that about one year after this system is in place a uh, customer can uh, really understand the distribution pattern well can see the suspect cases from uh, with the help of these analytics can monitor the familiar tree and the benefit uh, rationalization except john was speaking about uh, digital kyc uh, there is a this this platform is augmented with uh, advanced mobile capabilities such as geo sensing and video kyc that can also streamline the process and remove a lot of manual activities which otherwise takes a lot of time it is also integrated with social channels so like twitter facebook whatsapp any new request can be initiated through uh, these channels or uh, government can reach out to the citizens on these channels and i'll i'll have more details around it there are some extended capabilities 
in the system through which say for example i take an example of of a implementation where where we have integrated it with a central citizen i uh, authentication system and the system is so mature that it can authenticate uh, any person using biometric and iris so you can then make the whole authentication process the demographic information the rule set that runs over it entirely straight through and last but not the least is that it is it supports a modern uh, deployment architecture all the components are cloud native they can be deployed on any private or government cloud uh, inherently it supports microservices contain containerization and devops now after having this technology centric overview let us see how it looks for end users and for users of the system so here is a sample of portal uh, from where a user can self register can uh, after putting his demographic information or if there is an opportunity of integrating with some national id infrastructure then this will be uh, automated he can have his eligibility check done he can see what uh, what schemes are eligible he is eligible to apply for he can put online application can put supporting documents can track the status of his application and he can also see various dashboards to get more insights into uh, the whole government scheme and other uh, benefit programs that are running it is also available as a mobile app or it is it can be used even in the uh, mobile browser it is it is a quick view of the low code form that i was talking about so the form that is developed in the low code environment using drag and drop is now visible for end user to fill his details he or she can uh, submit supporting documents from here and after completing his application he can he can submit this applications uh, his this application for processing and this is how a rule engine which is working in the background automatically cross checks the eligibility of this person for particular uh, scheme or grant it also decides the appropriate routing of this application to a department or to a to a officer who is expert of managing such applications grant officer will get all applications in his work basket the framework allow high degree of personalization so that he can work with ease and efficiency he can see tracking report as per his level of intervention in the system so a, a senior officer can see for entire department someone can see for his own pendency or pendency for the immediate peers uh, he can then pick up one application and can really see all uh, details available submitted by the applicant along with the documentation which are submitted so he can browse through document he can see uh, metadata the data that is there in a very convenient jigsaw position uh, view he can raise exceptions like missing document or more information needed or background verification is needed or he can uh, set some rules for this application to be processed and finally when everything is in place he can also approve this application and like i was talking about the uh, dashboarding capability of the system you have you can really mine the data from here to get better insights uh, starting from uh, reports which can give insights into performance of these processes in terms of sla in terms of how much fund is distributed in terms of the the fund distribution across schemes or across uh, geo structure to an extent of then mining and doing analytics and discovery and uh, designing family trees uh, looking at some suspect or fraud cases or understanding more into uh, whether the uh, grant is properly distributed uniformly or it is it is skewed in some sense so all that can be done using a a comprehensive dashboarding and analytics capability
now one thing that i think this pandemic has made all of us realize that each and every software application from now would need some remote working capability and we have been very uh, very conscious about it and our digital platform have been a great enabler for our customers to work remotely and ensure their business continuity and what happens is that whenever you want to open such application to to uh, say work from home then many issues comes up especially with respect to security and privacy our platform has built in support for content encryption operation on secure layer strong authentication policies certification for security standards like like owasp to ensure that data is totally secure it also complies with uh, various privacy standards like uh, pdpa gdpr uh, intelligently data personal information can be identified in a document it can be masked it can be redacted uh, there there are schemes of keeping two copies say for example one is available for limited user one is available in larger public domain so this basically gives a comfort a sense of uh, security to our customer to open it for work from home or remote working capability and on this solid foundation we have built some more strong features uh, like it is fully web enabled it has intuitive mobile app support uh, there are features for real time collaboration it supports offline working it captures all the audit trail irrespective of where the user is working from so this basically put together makes it a, a great enabler for remote working now with our experience of having done so much of work across the globe uh, this system that i am uh, showcasing is proven in wide variety of uh, grant offering we have been very proactive in helping government globally to manage difficult situations posed by covid other than that uh, there are good examples where long running schemes are automated using our platform i'll talk about one of those uh, cases there are situations where uh, very quickly the system is ramped up for offering any disaster uh, relief like hurricane or or flood or anything like that uh, some uh, scientific uh, some uh, institutes are using it for providing support for scientific research some institutes are uh, using it to promote skill development in the country there are examples where project based funding is uh, is uh, uh, offered in terms of you know say for example if a young entrepreneur wants to make any uh, any new uh, research so there are several different examples which are there and let me showcase one of the latest, latest examples in this list with you uh, i'm sure that you know most of you will know about it this is about the paycheck protection program uh, that small business administration sba is uh, managing in us and i think this this program is one of the one of the largest uh, we have seen ever and uh, it is about uh, a loan which is designed to protect uh, to provide a direct incentive for small businesses to keep their workers on payroll and this this needed a quick solution development to provide a easy to use but comprehensive system that connects both borrower and lender uh, since borrower and lender both were remote it needed a strong and flexible digital platform to enable smooth work to enable smooth workflow across all the key stakeholders and with a with a strong integration framework it connected the data in in entire ecosystem and enabled first time right decision making and we were able to serve the need of entire value chain within 
uh, with the solution development in less than a week's time and now we are serving as much as 30 lenders as i speak and i keep hearing from uh, uh, my uh, team working on this uh, initiative is that for few customers uh, right from contract signing to onboarding took only 24 to 48 hours so this is this is how we uh, ready we are in terms of you know helping you to manage any such situation and i think this is not going away the covid or or such situations every agency has to start gearing up uh, become more proactive have such systems in place keeping the future in mind and in that context let me take the second example which is around uh, direct benefit transfer it is called direct benefit transfer because uh, the country has a infrastructure where uh, there is a national id in, uh, infrastructure with that a uh, bank account is also linked so once after proper approval and authentication the web benefit can be directly transferred to the account of uh, beneficiary similar to what john was suggesting when he was speaking about uh, a, a card for for uh, transferring the benefit to to citizens payment card as he said and in this case there are about 300 plus welfare schemes which are onboarded uh, across 35 departments and out of this 300 if we talk only about one which is scholarship uh, management the application goes as high as 5 million applications annually and we have 100,000 colleges and schools enrolled uh, in this system. <clears throat> After the system was implemented, the TAT, which was earlier used to be around uh, a month or so, has reduced from a month to three, four days. And prominent departments which are using this uh, uh, platform are social justice, higher technical education, minority development, tribal development, school education, agriculture department. And it is, it is a unique marquee implementation because it is end-to-end -end automated, right from uh, the application that comes onto the portal, the automatic authentication that takes place through the central ID infrastructure, eligibility check, some of the eligibility checks are also automated using the integration available with the other electronic systems such as attendance system or or uh, uh, marks of higher secondary and then it is also augmented by a very strong workflow for approval after the uh, this application is approved payment instruction is uh, released to a central system through which it goes directly in the bank account of beneficiary And with that, I would like to close my presentation. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, Monica, over to you for we can take any questions now. Thank you, Arpan. Thank you for that insightful presentation on how Newton's technology platform can enable a foolproof grants program. Uh, but I do hope that the COVID situation goes away soon, sooner than later. <laughs> um, uh, now time for the Q&A session, and we are actually flooded with a lot of questions. Uh, let me take the first, let me do it on a first come, first serve basis. So the first question that I saw on the screen was, policy decisions taken in response to the crisis are not perceived as permanent. So in a scenario when policies are situational and temporary, what is the feasibility of investing into procuring a new tech solution? Uh, Colin, would you want to take that? Yeah, I would be happy to take that. I, I think the, 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 the situation is one, I think is a great question. Um, to some extent, I think the, what the question is asking is, are these investments going to be here for the long term? And I think when, when you look at the way that technology is changing the way that businesses operate and the way that governments operate, 
I think we have to ask ourselves this question. Uh, how do we see our operating models over the, developing over the next three to five years? Okay. Where do we see our government and public sector service? Do we see it as relatively manual? What I can see in the region, and I hope this doesn't come across as a criticism, fairly disjointed. Therefore, in urgent need of modern technology and digital solutions in order to bring efficiency. I think my short answer to this is, this is in fact part and parcel of a much bigger plan. The, the fact that we focus here on grants and on welfare it's just the tip of the iceberg, the way I would put it. I think there has to be a much larger digital roadmap that our smaller countries in the Caribbean, as I mentioned, Monica, vulnerable countries need to look at seriously and develop a plan for seriously. In fact, my prognosis is one where I think over the next five to 10 years, in 2025 to 2030, if you if you if you if you think about the pace at which technology is developing, the world is going to be develop, divided in all probability into two islands. If I can use that, the term islands as a, as a, as 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 an example, right? And on one island, you're going to have those countries where people are highly connected. Governments have adopted digital solutions. Um, governments are conducting business using technology government to government, government to business, government to employees, right? And on those, on that island, you're likely to find that those countries are going to be, generally speaking, more efficient, more productive. Services to citizens are going to provide, a, are going to be of higher quality. The business community is going to be more productive. And on the other island are going to be countries that are that have largely stuck with legacy systems and have therefore become um, on a relative basis more and more inefficient compared to those countries that have adopted technology so i think you have to look at the bigger picture would be my position you have to take into account the fact that you have a certain amount of sunk costs in your legacy systems whether those systems are manual or whether it is legacy technology systems if it is not efficient, if it is not providing you with quality, if it's not providing quality services to the citizens and to the business community, then I think the business case for radical reform is there. So that would be my response to the question, Monica. Well, that's, that's a very uh, brilliant response, I must say, at least. I find it that way. In fact, you know, investment in technology and keeping pace with emerging technology is an imperative today and there's no denial to it. Uh, my second question is contextual to, to the first one, and uh, this is, how can technology providers address this unpredictability and provide higher assurance to clients to invest in new applications? Has Nugen improvised its deployment models to tackle these short-term requirements? So, Arpan, I think uh, you can take up this question. Yeah, sure. See, I think uh, it is always a combination. So government globally would continue running their social benefit program. And I have seen that without any exceptions, there are in some or the other form, you have social protection program, which offer based on the need of the country, which keep offering a variety of uh, schemes. and. Uh, some of them can be funded, some of them can be sponsored by uh, by the local government. So what, what we are saying is that the leverage of technology platform is much larger. So it is enabling you from two directions. One, it is very sound, it is robust and flexible, as comprehensive as, like I said, uh, one instance where there are approximately 350 schemes are running with such a huge uh, transaction load and so this is to ensure that you run your uh, schemes well you know that how it is benefiting citizens and you really uh, are able to create much needed impact second the same platform is also gearing you up in terms of quickly responding to anything if any unusual circumstances like covid comes up so investment in technology as colin was saying should not be seen as a short-term thing 
it is you have a bigger you should keep a bigger picture in mind and the leverage is much more because if you systematically invest in such platform the 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 platform upgrade will ensure you that you are on a track you are you are updated in terms of new uh, technologies that some of them i spoke about in my tech, my my presentation and this will you know really give you that uh, uh, speed and agility from both the direction one to run your ongoing schemes well and to be able to uh, roll out a new scheme in really a matter of days great yeah Monique. thanks serpent and uh, so i'll just take the last question for today uh, and this one is for colin and john what most can government fund technology initiatives when there is a tremendous fiscal pressure? John, I don't know if you have a comment, but I could say a few things and then you can jump in. I, I think everybody recognizes that the, the size of the fiscal deficit is going to increase significantly. I think any, everybody can see what the, what's happening in the more developed countries, um, where there's a significant level of quantitative easing. To some extent, they're actually printing money in order to be able to finance this. We have, from a fiscal perspective, more limitations in our marketplace. But we have to make difficult choices. Um, we have to determine very quickly whether we, we are prepared to transform and whether we are prepared to create more resilience in our economies. And I firmly believe that one of the factors that need to be considered is digital transformation as a form of resilience. We are aware of the fact that in a number of markets, Monica, when the mandatory stay home arrangements came into force, a large mm -hmm. segment of government shut down in the country, okay? Including mm -hmm. critical services could not be rendered. I'm not speaking about healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. okay. But I know that a number of countries struggle with the provision of critical services because they were not connected uh, via technology and the work from home type of arrangement was not a simple solution for them. So my answer to the question is that at this stage, uh, governments would have to consider carefully where their source of funds funding is going to have to come from. We will also have to consider their financial priorities, right? Um, when you look at the mm -hmm. budgeting process and the financial management process in these countries, um, I think a lot of money goes into recurring expenditure mm -hmm. and not enough focus is spent on what's the outcome. What are we really expending these funds for? What outcomes are we trying to obtain, achieve? And if they, mm -hmm. if they are adopted more outcome-based budgeting, where you're trying to define the outcome and you're connecting it to the expenditure, I think you could get to a better answer. Now, to make the change from traditional systems, which are cash-based, to outcome-based budgeting is a difficult process, but it's required at this point in time. To make a change from manual systems to, to modern technology, takes time and cost. One option is to get the private sector involved. And instead of spending money on the CapEx, spend the money on the OpEx. In other words, get service providers in place to be able to provide the solutions. Think about the concept of managed services and buying the service as opposed to trying to spend money on the capital aspect of the, of the equation. There are a number of options open that could be explored separately. And I think we are probably running out of time, but I think there are a number of options to, to be able to deal with these types of challenges, Monica. Yes. Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, very well pointed out. I know we are running out of time, but uh, you know that just tempts me to take one more question uh, because you know, that, that is a very common uh, common one that we come across. So the question is, what do you recommend? Evaluate technology first or the set of processes first? Or really, they should go hand in hand? If 
I guess Monica, I don't know if you think that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess in my experience with the audience, um, and, and, and particularly as, as it relates to this particular sector, right, the, the processes haven't really changed from since they were developed, right? So, you know, typically in, in this new age of technology, you know, you're here leveraging agile methodologies in terms of deployed solutions, et cetera, right? which is where you can get the best of both worlds looking at process and technology simultaneously. However, for, for this particular sector, and particularly with the government and public sector, you know, um, I do think there is a level of process reengineering that needs to be done. Simply because of obviously the you know the, the opportunities to, to reduce the amount of steps and and then obviously the introduction of different channels and technologies within that process. So I think getting the process right first, and again the, the biggest thing is obviously the enablers of the process. So like so stuff for something like this, there's a lot of regulations and policies that need to be considered and taken into account to see what opportunity there is for technology. Uh, a simple thing as, as, and I think it was shown at the, on the new gen slide, when you start to collect citizen data then, and being able to, to store that and leverage that based on your jurisdiction, am I allowed to even post that in the cloud? Um, what level, what, what aspect of, of, of the citizen can I capture, et cetera? So I do think for this particular sector, process and process reengineering should be the first start and, and understanding the opportunities and then that will then direct you in terms of what sort of solution, you know, and in terms of obviously on-prem cloud, et cetera, would be right for me. So, John, if okay. I could just add a couple of things just to end it off. I, I think one of the things that I would also add, Monica, to that question is that mm -hmm. I think what would be one of the most useful things would be for, you know, to build some sort of roadmap or plan. And I prefer the term roadmap, right? Um, okay. Because I think question is a great question, but I don't think it's an either or. It's not who comes first. I think there will be a number of priorities and initiatives and gaps, right? And the gaps will probably exist in infrastructure. There will be funding gaps, mm -hmm. there will be resource gaps. And I think there also, John mentioned a, a number of things that we see when we go across the market, right? Where the governments <laughs> need to really address their policies. What's the policies towards data security? What's the policies towards using the cloud? You know, what's the policies towards interoperability? All of those are relevant questions that have to be addressed in the roadmap. And I think pulling a roadmap together is, is, is critical to sort of give you an idea of what you're trying to deal with over the next three to five years. And then flowing from that, you would really understand what you need to put together. So I think it's an interesting question, but it's not a simple answer. It requires some thought and some process. I totally agree. And like you rightly said, the roadmap in itself would be an evolving target. Um, yeah, not something okay. that's static. <laughs> that's right. Uh, thank you, Colin. Thank you, John, for, for this answer. I really wish to take more questions, but this session is time bound. So I should park some pending questions, but we promise to send the, the responses over an email. Uh, dear audience, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thank you, panelists, for all your efforts and the brilliant insights that you have shared with us on this forum today. Now I sign off. Until we meet again, stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected. This is Monica Bish signing off now. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.